The evaluative no person argument, Lee and George explain, makes two claims. First, unlike the dualist no person argument, the evaluative argument grants that you are the human being, the physical organism, that came into existence at conception. Second, though you came into existence at conception, you did not become a person, valuable, and a bearer of rights until much later when you developed, for example, quote, the proximate or immediately exercisable capacity for self-consciousness, end quote. According to Lee and George, proponents of the evaluative no-person argument consider personhood to be an accidental attribute, like being a basketball player or a musician. Just like you come into existence at one point and then become a basketball player or a musician at a later point, so you come into existence at some point and then become a person later say, when you develop the capacity for self-consciousness. Proponents of the evaluative no-person argument conclude that human beings, such as human embryos and fetuses, which have yet to develop the capacity for self-consciousness, may be killed through abortion because they are not persons. As an example of someone who argued for this position, Lee and George quote Judith Thompson, who compares the right to life with the right to vote. She writes, quote, if children are allowed to develop normally, they will have a right to vote. That does not show that they now have a right to vote, end quote. In the same way, she argues that, although embryos and fetuses will have a right to life if allowed to develop normally, this does not show that embryos and fetuses now have a right to life. Presumably, this is because the right to vote and the right to life each depend upon acquiring some accidental attribute. The right to vote requires becoming an adult with legal citizenship, whereas the right to life requires becoming a person. Lee and George respond to the evaluative no-person argument in two ways. First, they argue that the right to vote and the right to life are not analogous because they are different kinds of rights. Some rights vary or accrue with factors like place, circumstance, maturity, ability, and so on, while other rights do not. The right to vote, Lee and George argue, is one of the former rights because, as they mention, one may have a right to vote in Switzerland, but not in Mexico. In contrast, Lee and George argue that the right to life is one of the latter rights because having the right to life is to have moral status at all, or, quote, to be the sort of entity that can have rights or entitlements, end quote. Therefore, Lee and George conclude that, given the fundamental nature of the right to life, we should expect the right to life to be radically different than other rights, such as the right to vote. Lee and George then dive deeper into the radical difference between the nature of the right to vote and the right to life. They argue that the right to vote, among other rights, is a right to, quote, perform a specific action in a specific situation, end quote, while the right to life is to have moral status at all, and that moral status, quote, follows from an entity's being the type of thing or substantial entity it is, end quote. They then conclude that since moral status is derived from the kind of thing something is and not from acquiring some accidental attribute, the right to vote and the right to life are not analogous. The second way in which Lee and George respond to the evaluative no-person argument arises from how the proponents connect personhood to an accidental attribute. Those who defend the evaluative no-person argument do not want to argue that the accidental attribute required for personhood is an actual behavior. The reason is because if the accidental attribute was an actual behavior, say, exercising higher mental functions, then human beings who are asleep or in reversible comas would be excluded from personhood. Though they have the potential to exercise higher mental functions, they are not actually exercising those higher mental functions when they are sleeping or in comas, and therefore would not be persons. As a result, the defenders of the evaluative no-person argument must argue that the accidental attribute is some capacity or potential for higher mental functions. However, Lee and George point out that embryonic human beings possess a capacity or potentiality for higher mental functions. If left alone, Embryonic human beings will actively develop themselves to the point where they will be able to exercise the capacity or potentiality for higher mental functions. To exclude embryonic human beings as persons, a distinction must be made between two types of capacity or potentiality. First, 
and, quote, immediately or nearly immediately exercisable capacity, end quote, and second, quote, a basic natural capacity to develop oneself to the point where one does perform such actions, end quote. Proponents of the evaluative no-person argument argue that the accidental attribute required for personhood is the first sort of capacity or potentiality. Lee and George, though, respond by asking, upon what basis can the proponents of the evaluative argument require the first sort of capacity or potentiality and not just the second? Indeed, Lee and George provide three reasons why personhood should be tied to just a basic natural capacity for higher mental functions, which something has in virtue of the kind of thing it is. First, human beings do not develop the immediately or nearly immediately exercisable capacity for characteristically human mental functions until several months after birth. Therefore, if someone believes that embryonic human beings may be aborted due to lacking the immediately or nearly immediately exercisable capacity for characteristically human mental functions, then they are logically committed to the seemingly untenable position that, subject to parental approval, human infants do not deserve full moral status and may be aborted. Second, only a difference in degree exists between human beings with the basic natural capacity for higher mental functions and human beings with the immediately or nearly immediately exercisable capacity for higher mental functions. As a result, by attaching personhood to having the immediately or nearly immediately exercisable capacity for higher mental functions, proponents of the evaluative no-person argument allow merely a quantitative difference to justify radically different treatment, which, quote, violates the most basic canons of justice, end quote. According to Lee and George, there's merely a quantitative difference between human beings with the basic natural capacity for higher mental functions and human beings with the immediately or nearly immediately exercisable capacity for higher mental functions, because there exists no difference in kind. The reason there is no difference in kind is because the difference between human beings with the basic natural capacity for higher mental functions and human beings with the immediately or nearly immediately exercisable capacity for higher mental functions is merely the development of the same underlying capacity found in both. This view, coupled with the basic moral principle that, quote, a mere quantitative difference, having more or less of the same feature, such as the development of a basic natural capacity, cannot by itself be a justificatory basis for treating different entities in radically different ways, end quote. Lead Lee and George to conclude that human beings with the basic natural capacity for higher mental functions and human beings with the immediately or nearly immediately exercisable capacity for higher mental functions should not be treated in radically different ways. In contrast, Lee and George highlight how it is precisely because of the fact that the gametes, sperm and ova, in human embryos are of fundamentally different kinds that we may treat them in radically different ways. We may destroy the gametes without a second thought, but we may not do the same with human embryos. The proponents of the evaluative no-person argument, Lee and George argue, neglect to follow the most basic moral principle that likes ought to be treated alike. Instead, they assign personhood to some human beings, but not others, attempting to establish justification for radically different treatment based upon the degree to which the same underlying basic natural capacity has been developed. Third, quote, if human beings were worthy of full moral respect as subjects of rights, only because of such qualities, that is, self-consciousness, intelligence, or rationality, and not in virtue of the kind of being they are, then, since such qualities come in varying degrees, no account could be given of why basic rights are not possessed by human beings in varying degrees. According to Lee and George, if the right to life comes with possessing the basic natural capacity for higher mental functions, then the proposition, all men are created equal, is true and not mere superstition. For all people, in virtue of the kind of thing they are, possess the basic natural capacity for higher mental functions. But if the right to life comes with possessing such qualities as self-consciousness, intelligence, or rationality, then all men are not created equal. Rather, as these qualities come in degrees, those people who have developed their self-consciousness or intelligence or rationality more than others would have greater rights 
Not willing to accept this absurd and disturbing conclusion, Lee and George again conclude that the right to life comes not with possessing the immediately or nearly immediately exercisable capacity for higher mental functions, but with possessing the basic natural capacity for higher mental functions. These three reasons considered, Lee and George draw the following overarching conclusion. Quote, in sum, human beings are valuable as subjects of rights in virtue of what they are, but what they are are human physical organisms. Human physical organisms come to be at conception. Therefore, what is intrinsically valuable as a subject of rights comes to be at conception. End quote. 